Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. On today's show, we'll visit with retired publisher Otis Chandler, whose vintage museum in Oxnard, California, houses some of the world's rarest collector cars. Then we'll take a look at a new car that's very personal, and some cars of the past at the Checker Cab Boneyard. Jeez, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So join me and a few car-crazy celebrities at the Peterson Automotive Museum. yabba dabba -doo. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Stay tuned for all the action when Car Crazy returns. Welcome back to Car Crazy. Recently, I went for a little ride with Otis Chandler in his 1933 Packard Dietrich Sport Phaeton, one of three ever built. Otis is a guy who really loves his cars. My wife doesn't, uh, she didn't understand how I, I mean, she knows I love the cars, but she doesn't understand how I can use that term, love. Love. And, and most really dedicated car guys say, I love my Corvette, or I love my this or that. And women look at him, what do you mean you love it? What's the term love is supposed to be meant for dogs, horses, humans, but not cars. Otis is the retired publisher and editor-in-chief and former owner of the Los Angeles Times. But the only pictures in his Oxnard, California Vintage Museum that depict his illustrious career in publishing are of his newspaper's delivery vehicles. Talk about a car guy. The museum was created in 1987 as a meeting place for automobile, motorcycle, and wildlife enthusiasts. It is a testament of his dedication to the preservation of history. The museum houses more than 50 historically significant cars, including Packards, Duesenbergs, V16 Cadillacs, and performance sports and American muscle cars. Upstairs are over 150 of the rarest motorcycles in the world. Otis Chandler's love for cars, combined with his yearning for speed, has developed into a passion for racing his sports cars on the track. For Otis, it seems that the value of these cars is measured in their aesthetic appeal and their performance. We return to the museum, where we had a chance to sit down and discuss Otis's passion for the automobile. Well, the Chandler name is famous in the Los Angeles area and worldwide for more than just cars and being car guys, but of course this media empire that you have run. Uh, give me a little capsule. Yeah. Uh, our viewers would probably enjoy a little insight to, uh, to understand yeah. Otis Chandler, the, uh, the businessman. I just recently retired after 50 years with the Los Angeles Times and the Times Mirror Company. I was publisher for many of those years. I trained in all the departments when I got out of the Air Force and worked yeah. in every department. I sold advertising and I worked in the press room and all of that. And then after I left the Times, I ran the Times Mirror Company, which owns other newspapers and media around the country. So uh, that occupied most of my time. That was a, a great fun, too. But uh, the cars were a great balance. I'd get tied up in meetings and, and then I just tell my secretary, you know, I just got to leave. Tell the people I just can't. So I get in my car and go out to a little little garage uh, I had out in El Monte and, and there were a few cars and Porsches and I just to stand there and just kind of look at them and then go back to my next meeting it was a, it was a good it was a good de-stressor I guess yes. is the right word. Well Otis you are certifiably car crazy and it goes way back to when you were a kid. Like a lot of kids took an old lawnmower my dad had and made it into a go-kart and we had a long hill Going down was this with his permission? No, no, no. He didn't know about it, but he'd gotten a new one, a new model or something like that. So made a little go-kart, 
And uh, he found out about it, though, because I went down the driveway one day, and I was trying to get it to go faster and faster, and I hit the gardener. You hit the gardener. Hit the gardener. Yeah, he was walking down the driveway, and he went right up in the air. Didn't hurt himself, you know. Came down and brushed himself off, and, of course, it was reported. And so uh, that was my first accident. <laughs> This is one of my favorite places on the planet, so uh, you have so many great things to look at here. Thank you. Well, we're, I think we're unique and we're, we're different. We're not uh, like any other museum. I mean, how many museums have what we have here in terms of cars and motorcycles and a train? We have a steam locomotive here and a Mack truck, and uh, I have a great collection of animals that I've collected all over the world, and we have great tapestries here. So there's a little bit for everybody. There's nothing like having Otis himself taking us on a personal tour of his museum. Barry, this is a, a beautiful uh, Duesenberg. It's a LeBaron body, one-of-a-kind Duesenberg. You can always tell the Duesenberg by this unique hood ornament. Uh, it has uh, the louvers in front that are uh, uh, controlled by um, heat and those open. And the classics generally have these wonderful big headlights and the wonderful horns and a really classic look. They're really pieces of art. This particular car here, is a Madam X V16 Cadillac 1932. It was made for the head of General Motors of Canada, and he specified that he wanted silver here and gold here and the wonderful uh, designs on the, on the seats. That's, that's handmade. This car here is Joan Crawford's car. It was sold new in Hillcrest on Wilshire Boulevard. It just had a paint job. Um, is all, it's never been frame off restoration. This was her personal car. And she, does, people who are had a famous uh, personality, movie stars and actors and actresses, they specified what they wanted in the car. She didn't want to have her, her face distorted by chrome, a uh, roll down window handle or a door handle, so she had them pewtered. And uh, so this is her car. Portia asked me to dedicate this to uh, the late Mark Donahue, because those are the Sunoco colors. And so the Porsche painted this, especially the blue, the Sunoco blue, and then I put on the Sunoco other colors, which are the yellow and the red. So this car is, is really devoted to Mark Donahue. Don't go away. We'll explore the racier side of Otis's passion when Car Crazy returns. We're here in Oxnard, California at the Vintage Museum of Transportation and Wildlife with none other than the curator, founder, and, and great car guy, Otis Chandler. You know, you never do anything halfway, and that applies equally well to your racing career. I signed up for race school, came out of race school, and I decided well, I'll start with a twin turbo 935, 220 mile an hour car, and I'll, I'll participate in the Watkins Glen uh, six hour endurance. And a good friend of mine, John Thomas, uh, taught me the race course and taught me a lot about racing, things that I didn't know, the, the fine points of, the, uh, of racing that I didn't, of course, pick up in race school because you can't pick up everything. He qualified the car. I, I practiced for a week and got my times down. Scared the hell out of me going that fast um, on a road course. Um, twin turbo Porsche is a very fast car. I mean, it's, uh, you know, 220 mile car based on based on uh, your gearing. But uh, the race day came along, and um, John went out in about mid-pack, qualified mid-pack. You're only allowed to do an hour. You have to come in for a driver's change and gas and IMSA racing. And so he came in, I got in, and it downpoured. And, and my family's there, and I'm nervous, you know, and, and then He's, but I had to go out because he's not allowed to go out. Uh, he, he already had his shift. Sure. So I went out in the pouring rain. They put on rain tires. And um, I went out, and I was up near the front uh, going out, and uh, it was just a blur. All the downshift points and the braking points on Watkins Glen were all a blur because of the rooster tails coming out oh. of the guys in front of me. Guys were spinning off the track. I don't know how many during that rain downpour when they restarted the race, went off the track, and I just kind of, you know, I lost a, a, lot of the, a lot of the instruction that I should have remembered, and I went into the old stab and steer, which is just <laughs> instinct, stab and steer. And uh, eventually they brought me in and uh, put on slicks, and we were up in the top 10 or maybe the top five by then. 
Really? And um, I completed my shift, and um, uh, John took another shift, and we wound up uh, sixth overall out of 35 cars and third in our class, this unknown team from California with this 50-year-old grandfather publisher. Then I came home and did start vintage racing in the, in the 917.30, and that is a... That's a different level. It's a whole <laughs> different level. I mean, 935 is fast, but the 917.30... Let's explain the 917.30. Okay, 917.30 is the ultimate 12-cylinder Porsche that was designed and made specifically for Roger Penske and Mark Donahue. 12-cylinder, 1,200 horsepower, twin turbo, and then a dial down here, you can dial up 200 more horsepower. Of all the cars that you've had, was this your favorite? I would say yes. That car just kind of represented to me the pinnacle of any car any guy would like to own. At this point in time, it's so obvious that you're much relieved and you're just having the time of your life yes. now with, with really yeah. focusing on the, yeah. the, the things that light your fire, which is the passion for cars. Now I will have the time to enjoy my cars, the motorcycle, surfing and bicycling and my grand, I got 17 grandchildren. and. Just a lot of a lot of things that I'd like travel and so on. So seventeen gonna... grandchildren, seventeen car guys and gals, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Otis. We'll meet the inventor of the sparrow when Car Crazy returns. Welcome back to Car Crazy. Call him a visionary or passionate entrepreneur. This Northern California businessman built the most successful motorcycle seat company in the world. Then he set off to conquer the world of alternative powered vehicles. Some would say he's nuts for trying to reinvent the wheel. Our diagnosis, Mike Corbin is definitely car crazy. Well, I'm a, I'm a student of car guys and car guys have a lot of fortitude. I mean, every car company that exists today was started by somebody with a dream. I mean, without exception almost, and I study the, all the origins in cars. In fact, we had a press release about a month ago where we, Tucker made 51 cars and we made 52. So we had a press release. We finally caught up with Tucker, who was one of my great distant mentors. So when we went into the idea of making the electric car, we didn't actually go into the car industry and say, well, we're going to be car guys like uh, the big guys. We actually said, we're going into the car industry, but we're niche hunters. We want to find something that actually doesn't exist and we want to create that part. So people say, now, well, how do you stack up compared to car guys? And I always tell them, well, you know, I'm not really in the car business. I'm in the sparrow business. Well, I thought about this for 25 years, actually. I was uh, educated as an electrical engineer, and um, I always rode motorcycles. So the idea was, is there some way that we can have the agility of a motorcycle in traffic have an enclosed vehicle for weather protection, be able to lock it up when you leave it in traffic, and uh, came up with the idea that what we needed was um, a one-passenger, three-wheel car. We put a lot of the battery weight in the front along with the two front wheels, so if anything did happen, the mass would be able to absorb some of the energy from the crash. We put the motor in the back underneath the seat, which drives the rear wheel. There's 13 batteries, some of them are underneath the seat, and some of them are underneath the hood. So it's a 156 volt drivetrain. What we are is a 65 mile an hour car that has a capacity to go 40 or 50 mile range. You don't need gas, uh, only costs two cents a mile. You're, you're unique, all people want to talk about it everywhere you go, people want to stand around for hours and talk about alternative energy and electric cars and how you got this idea to make a micro car. It's just a lot of fun to be part of. Um, it's, it's part of the car passion. It's, it's not a Ferrari, but it is passion. Control is very good. Uh, most of the weight is within the triangle of the footprint of the tires. So the weight is centralized to the rubber. It has a very short wheelbase, so it's very agile in traffic. When you see a Sparrow, you know what it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a small car that was made for commuters to go into the city or where you needed clean air. So we didn't want to look like a Ferrari. We wanted to look like a Sparrow. So our own unique look was very important. So that's the design dream come true. A totally enclosed vehicle that you can put into motorcycle parking. 
That should help the cities with congestion into the future. Now let's take a peek back in history to cars that were made for passengers. If you were to hail a taxi in days gone by, it most likely would have been a checkered cab. Formed in 1922 in Kalamazoo, Michigan, by a Russian immigrant named Morris Barkin, the checkered cab company served most of the major cities in the United States during the days of giant taxicab fleets. In 1982, Checkered stopped making its famous taxi cabs due to rising gasoline and labor costs. Most Checkers were retired by the late 1980s. Since then, Checker cabs have become relics, rusting in garages, barns, and junkyards. Less than a decade before Checker discontinued manufacturing their cars, Ben Merkel started hoarding them. Ben keeps his cars in the Amish town of Middlefield, Ohio, where the collection continues to grow as a source of restorable taxis and parts. Presently, there are only 2,500 to 3,000 checker cabs left in existence. Ben Merkel has nearly 200 of them. Some may call him eccentric, but you know what we call him, car crazy. I just sort of felt, you know, like they're an underdog car. You know, hardly anybody collects the old ones, and I just got into it. And if you own a couple checkers, you got to have some parts cars, and so then you wind up with a bunch of cars. And the cab companies, of course, once they stopped using checkers, the parts went right out the door. So I sort of took over that spot as an aftermarket. This is the last checker body style that incorporated the suicide door arrangement, which meant the door opened like this. Uh, but for safety reasons, everyone has stepped away from this design. And this particular car is a 1964 checker limousine. It was bought new by the uh, Spiegel Catalog Company of Chicago as sort of a, their pr one of their private cars. I think it's interesting that Checker was able to make an inroad into the luxury market with cars like this, since most people associate these only with taxis that have austere interiors. In the 1960s, this is what you would see at the airport uh, instead of the vans. A restored Checker can bring 20,000 and more. It can cost that much to fix a car, too. So 20,000 might not even cover a restoration today. Not only do checker cabs have a special place in American history, but the histories of particular cabs can be fascinating as well. Now this checker is a 1981 checker that was uh, sold new in New York City originally. And then it went to uh, Fort Knox, where it uh, spent the next couple years on the Army base. And uh, then I bought it from Fort Knox. And then I uh, sold it to somebody who uh, trashed it. And then I went and rescued it again when it was uh, about to be uh, sent off to the boneyard. So it was a good thing it wound up back in the fold. You know, I love New York City. This car went up and down Broadway, you know, went through the Lincoln Tunnel, went across the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it's like having a large souvenir. Thanks for the memories, Ben. We'll be right back with more Car Crazy, so don't go away. Welcome back to Car Crazy. Recently, the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California, played host to the third annual Cars and Stars Gala, which brought together dignitaries from the automotive and entertainment industries. The red carpet was rolled out as the museum benefactors Bob and Margie Peterson were on hand to greet the esteemed guests. We were there to find out what makes these celebrities car crazy. Building automobiles is a constant state of development. You never finish developing. If you go out looking for a girl, you won't find one. But if you're just having dinner one night, oh, look, hey, she's cute. You know, and then you go over and you start talking to her. And then the same thing with cars. That's where I am with cars. You know, when I bought my 56 Chrysler Imperial, I wasn't looking for one. I didn't even want one. But this one was such a nice, straight, original car that, oh, I, well, I got to get that car. The challenge of having the car that you've created for the person or the film or the purpose that's made them happy, that's what makes me happy. When I was a kid, I used to race on the street in Philadelphia. We used to block it off 26th Street. And uh, I guess that was the biggest. The biggest thrill was when I took the car back to the house and my dad said, how come the clutch doesn't work? Anything with four wheels, shiny, a primer, a few dents in it, that's fine by me. 
I saw an Isotta Fraschini, a little kid about 11 years old in Italy, and it had a, it had a, a shiny hood that was about a mile and a half long. Well, I mean, I've always loved them, and um, I was the only girl to ever write a hot rod song. I took my Cobra down to the track. Well, I have the first Viper, Viper 1, but I really drive minivans because that's what made the company. You bet. That's the right. cash cow. Yeah. That's the one yeah. you talk about. So I have one in every, I have four houses. I have a minivan in every place. Yeah. Do you really? There should be one in every garage <laughs> in the U.S. I like the bug, the Beetle. <laughs> have you driven that new one? Yeah, it's, it's a nice car. Turbo, it? oh, it's yeah. great car, man. I use it all the time. Actually, my favorite old car I just sold up at Pebble Beach, which uh, was a uh, four and a half liter 1928 Bentley Le Mans. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But I sold it. It's sad. Uh, favorite. It's here. Well, I had a chance to to drive Augie Duesenberg's uh, Mormon Meteor uh, on the Salt Lakes. So I'm a frustrated driver with no no talent whatsoever, but I love it. What was your craziest driving experience? Is this a cable? <laughs> It was all part of an evening where the guests could appreciate the fine collection of cars at the museum while checking into making a purchase of their own at the Christie's auction display. A silent auction was also held to benefit the museum's educational program. And overall, $250,000 was raised. A good time was had by all, including the evening celebrity host, Jay Leno, who saved some time to scout out his next ride. Not to be forgotten during the evening was the premiere of the new Hollywood Star Cars Great Cars of the Movies exhibit, which displayed many fine examples of movie cars through the decades. The trilogy of George Barris's Batmobiles was together for the very first time, along with other famous Barris creations such as Fred and Wilma's own Flintmobile, or the James Dean Porsche Spider featured in Live Fast, Die Young. Remember Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon driving this 1966 Thunderbird off the cliff in Thelma and Louise? Looks like it really came through without a scratch. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have, and I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more car crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the McGuire's family of Appearance Car Care Products. McGuire's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.